Like in all countries of the world, people in the United States experience a concept called environmental racism. People of ethnic minorities and low socioeconomic status increasingly carry the burden of environmental and health risks in their neighborhoods, workplace, and playgrounds when compared to society at large. For example, a Commission for Racial Justice study found that African Americans are 79% more likely than whites to live in neighborhoods where industrial pollution is suspected of causing the greatest danger to overall health. This study found that three of the five largest waste facilities dealing with hazardous materials in the United States are located in poor black communities. This study also showed that three out of every five African Americans and Latinos live in areas near toxic waste sites, as well as live in areas where the levels of poverty are well above the national average. The Commission for Racial Justice contends that approximately half of all Native Americans live in communities with an uncontrolled toxic waste site. Children of color who live in poor areas are more likely to attend schools filled with asbestos, live in homes with peeling lead paint, and play in parks that are contaminated. These same children are nearly nine times more likely than economically advantaged children to be exposed to lead levels so high they can cause severe learning disabilities, as well as other neurological disorders. Even more startling, 96% of African American children who live in inner cities have unsafe amounts of lead in their blood. Over the last few decades, grassroots groups all over the country have begun to address environmental racism. They have organized and empowered their communities to improve the way government regulations as well as health and environmental policies are created and implemented. These advocates are part of the burgeoning environmental justice movement. Environmentalism can now be said to be equated with social justice and civil rights. This issue of environmental racism has affected a myriad of people in a variety of realms throughout U.S. history. Whether it is more hazardous jobs, houses with dangerous lead levels, or proximity to industrial factories and waste disposal sites, people face environmental inequality daily. In the United States, we see that African American communities in the East and South, Latino communities in the Southwest, and Native American nations all over the country must carry the burden of environmental inequality. Case Studies Let's start with a national case study from 1992 concerning corporate welfare in Louisiana. The southern U.S. holds a history wrought with racial inequalities and a colonial mentality that encourages external big business over the large number of citizens living in the region, who are often exploited because of their economic and political powerlessness. This region is sometimes known as a sacrifice zone, meaning environmental conditions and human health are traded for economic gain. Louisiana exemplifies how levels of toxic industrial pollution are often correlated with poor economic conditions. In 1992, the Institute for Southern Studies Green Index rated Louisiana 49 out of 50 states in overall environmental quality. Louisiana is not a wealthy state. It is ranked 45th in spending on education this same year, for example. The combination of these ratings is not surprising when we look at the prevalence of corporations receiving corporate welfare or lenient regulations and tax breaks that allow pollution of local air, water, and land in the process of the production of much of America's petrochemicals. In two parish towns, Gaismar and St. Gabriel, 18 chemical plants are squeezed into a 9.5 square mile area. These companies, one by the name of Borden Chemicals, have been found to illegally store hazardous waste, fail to install containment systems, burn hazardous waste without a permit, contaminate groundwater below the plant, and ship toxic waste without notifying the Environmental Protection Agency, or EPA. Some fines were imposed for these corporate crimes, but much of these are negated by the large number of tax breaks that these companies receive from the state and national government. A justification for subsidizing these businesses is the creation of jobs for local citizens. Although job creation is a legitimate concern, researcher Robert Bullard reveals with detailed data that the few jobs that are created by subsidizing polluting companies come at a high risk to local taxpayers and the environment. A growing body of evidence shows that environmental regulations do not kill jobs, and in fact, according to PT Template, states with lower pollution levels and better environmental policies generally have more jobs, better socioeconomic conditions, and are more attractive to new business. Now let's move to an example that for some may hit extremely close to home. 
groundwater contamination of low-income Latino neighborhoods in South Tucson, Arizona. TCE was a chemical solvent that was widely used by Hughes Aircraft Company, now Raytheon, and Hamilton Aviation in Tucson after World War II to clean engine parts and strip and clean plane surfaces for repair and repainting. The chemical was dumped improperly, getting into aquifers around the Tucson International Airport, giving people in the surrounding neighborhoods a variety of health conditions. A Tucson Citizen newspaper article describes how the effect neighborhoods who tried to stand up for their rights to clean water and the health of their children were told by bureaucrats that they were getting sick because of their ethnicity rather than the industrial solvent. The effects of this contamination are still very relevant to families today. Court cases and lawsuits continue to play out, and although money has helped to heal some of the pain of this Southside community, affected members will never receive true reparations for the loss of such health and life.